if you're trying to bring life science parks into those those areas, where's your workforce? Where's your workforce coming? Is the workforce in those areas, immediate areas, are they, have they been developed or not? Some companies are, are looking into adaptive reuse to, to adapt these office spaces into residential or you know even potentially into data centers. Please to have this conversation with you, Nadeg, because you're you're in the industry. Right. You know it well. You've done some fascinating, uh, built some fascinating structures. This is Maestro Minute, the show that discusses all things real estate, sharing interviews with the most successful people in the industry. Hear from their perspective and what they are doing to achieve success. Get exclusive tips on how you can also succeed in real estate. Maestro Minute is brought to you by Maestro Development. Here's your host, Nareg Muradian. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Maestro Minute. I'm your host, Nareg Muradian, and today we have another special guest. Super excited today. We have Miran Tumajan. Nice to see you, Miran. Great to see you, Nareg. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is a wonderful yeah. setting. So today we're going to go a little bit about uh, government relations, uh, specific to California, Southern California, uh, a little bit deeper. Uh, but before we dive in, let's uh, light up our cigars. Wonderful. What, what, do you, what do you have over there? I have an Avo Impreso. In, intermezzo. In, intermezzo. Yeah, intermezzo. Yeah, that's good. Avo is good. I'm going today with the Padron uh, Anniversary Series. I guess it's the... Uh, Cigar of the year a year ago. Oh, uh, that's nice. So let's go ahead. I like the uh, the orange container for the Avo, which matches my tie today, as you see. Did you plan that, or is that that was not planned? That was not planned. So, uh, just a quick introduction. Um, currently, in your current role, you're government relations manager to NIA office in Southern California. Exactly. Um, go ahead. So we cover uh, NIA SoCal is uh, is one of fifty four. Uh, chapters uh, of, of the NAOP of National Association of Industrial and Office Parks across North America. We are the second largest chapter by way of membership. We have uh, a bit over 1,300 dues paying members, second only after the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and we, we, uh, we just beat out Toronto, uh, our friends up, up in the, the, the great north. Uh, uh, to, to take over second place. That, that happened towards the, uh, the end of 2023. Uh, we, are, we, we have members uh, across Los Angeles and Orange Counties uh, in the commercial real estate industry, and they include uh, owners, investors of commercial real estate, as uh, developers, brokers, uh, architects, engineers, um, uh, finance professionals. Uh, okay. Uh, so, you know, construction, so basically, main goal is to enhance real estate, commercial real estate in Southern California. And enhance you, yeah. uh, and also serve as their voice, their, their advoc the, the, the advocates of the commercial real estate industry, both in Los Angeles and Orange Counties, before the Board of Supervisors, but also within uh, municipal jurisdictions within both counties. And that, that equals 122 municipal jurisdictions. Uh, straddling both counties, and that's that's quite a bit. We also, of course, advocate in Sacramento uh, with the state legislature before the state assembly and the state senate, uh, and and certainly the governor. And and, right. um, and then we also are active on the regulatory side, advocating before uh, uh, you know the Air Resources Board, California Air Resources Board, uh, the South Coast Air Quality uh, Management District (AQMD), yeah. and other regulatory agencies. I think I probably, we probably met about 10 years ago, roughly, and you've been doing the whole government relations thing for about a decade, right? How, about, did, how, yeah. how did you get into government relations? So I, I, I got involved in the 1990s, initially, in oh. Washington, D.C. I spent a few years in D.C., uh, and part of that time was spent uh, advocating um, uh, on Capitol Hill, of course, being in Washington, D.C., um, I've also spent some time uh, interning and working at think tanks in Washington, D.C., research institutions. Um, in the year 2000, moved to Southern California and, and got involved in uh, the, the, the wireless industry. So I went in, into business um, 
wireless sort of morphed into the software yeah. industry over time. So I was in, I was yeah. in, uh, I was not involved with government, albeit as a volunteer, I've always been involved. Uh, how did you, how did but, you? But I became yeah. involved in, in government affairs when I, uh, in 2016, when I uh, ser uh, uh, served as the Western, started serving as the Western Region Director of the Armenian Assembly of America, which is a nationwide uh, nonprofit advocacy organization that advocates for the, the rights of uh, uh, Ar Armenians, uh, Armenian Americans, uh, and certainly uh, strives to improve relations between the United States and Armenia um, and the United States. Uh, I, I always want to ask people. you, how did you know to get into the government relations side? What? I've always been fascinated with, and, and that goes back to my, my time in Washington in the 1990s. Um, you know, meetings on the Hill, uh, working with staff, you know, to get language into uh, legislation, into, into bills and resolutions and amendments. Uh, so that's always fascinated me. Uh, and then after that, about roughly a 15 year interregnum where I worked in, in the strictly in the business community, um, uh, in wireless electronics and also in, in software, uh, software solutions, this, this opportunity availed itself. And uh, I thought this would be great um, <clears throat> to, uh, you know, to, to get back into, yeah. into lobbying, into advocacy. Uh, and, I, and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, what is know, it like when you're in, on the Hill, you're, you're meeting with different folks, whether it's Congress, what are those meetings like? Do, are you, is it pretty receptive? Are they pretty challenging? What, what, is, what is that experience like? So, so, you know, when you prepare for meetings, um, you prepare your delegation, of course, with talking points. And, and certainly you got to have at least one ask when you go to each meeting. There has mm -hmm. to be at least one ask. Uh, one thing that you want that member to to look into and come through for you, um, it, and it could be some something long long term, uh, a, a bill that was recently introduced, or it could be something like more immediate. Yeah. Whatever it is, you know, you got to have the asks. It's always good also to to prep staff in advance so they have an idea of the subjects you want to talk about, so that it's a, a productive meeting. And that goes, you know, whether it's a meeting with the member, with the elected official, or with staff, or, or both. Um, you know, that's always it's always good when you at least, you know, let them know in yeah. advance this is the agenda, this is why we're here, this is what we want to talk about. Right. Um, Are they pretty receptive to hearing your thoughts and ideas? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, for the most part, uh, you know. When you're when you're frank with them that these are the issues that we care about that our constituency cares about your constituency you as right. as an assembly member or a, a state senator that your constituents care about and and some of them are part of our delegation for example we would pinpoint who could be a constituent mm -hmm. of a of a certain member of Congress or a state senator or a state assembly member that's that always goes well usually because that's reinforced during the meeting yeah that member steps up and says you know I'm so and so. I work with this company and I'm, you know, I'm, I live in your district or I, you know, my office is in your district. And, um, uh, and in some cases, you know, Na with NAOP SoCal, our, our members who are part of our delegation, um, you know, they've met with that yeah. elected official. There's a good chance they met with them before. So they may, they may know each other on a first name basis. And that's always, that's always good. Um, but, but, you know, we, we do a lot of follow up as well after the meeting with staff to reinforce some of the the points we made and certainly the ask that we we made and you know in terms of in terms of sacramento um you know we also you know sacramento and washington dc um we have opportunities to do fly-ins every year um what's so a fly-in a fly-in is when you your organization and so for for washington dc for example our our corporate headquarters naops corporate headquarters is in is in the D.C. area. It's in Northern Virginia. So they organize a fly-in so that all 54 chapters have an opportunity to fly in to Washington, mm. D.C., partake in conference sessions, but also uh, have meetings on Capitol Hill. Uh, and so, so you know, we, we enjoy doing that as, at NAOP SoCal. Uh, it's an opportunity for our members to join us uh, we set up the meetings for our, our members on, on the Hill. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we provide talking points to the members and also yeah. uh, we share leave behind material um, with, with staff uh, and, and with the elected official reinforcing, you know, what's important to the you know, SoCal. Mm -hmm. What are the key, what are the key uh, issues, you know, whether it's infrastructure, you know, uh, California leads the way uh, among, among all 50 states uh, when it comes to electrification, when it comes to uh, building, building the, the infrastructure, you know, um, for uh, electric vehicles and, and uh, you know, uh, fuel efficient vehicles. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, but there's so much more that we need to do, we must do, because our benchmarks here in California uh, are much, much higher oftentimes than even the EPA's own benchmarks, the federal government's own right. benchmarks. So we have, we have committed to lead the way uh, but we need the federal government to, to really come through with, with, with robust funding to, to support infrastructure. Yeah, you're, you're really shaping legislation and influence, especially for the commercial market. When I, when I was in Capitol Hill in 2008, um, and I, I remember we met with um, a congressman from Orange County, and I just was just enjoy the energy and the dialogue that's up there you know like you know that you always hear like drain the swamp or all this like you know yeah. stuff and rhetoric but like when i was there it just seemed like everything there was a lot of great conversations and a lot of thinking and like doing the right thing for the country right whether it's for a state or a local group or or or, or internationally i mean i love i love that experience and you're doing that i think on a daily basis that's pretty amazing Daily right. basis, certainly uh, for NAAP SoCal, our focus is, is mainly on, on uh, legislation that, that impacts uh, Southern California, LA and Orange counties, uh, certainly. Uh, and but you're specific to LA, LA and, and Orange, Orange counties. County. Yeah, okay. our chapter focuses on, on those two counties. We, we <laughs> also have uh, uh, sister chapters, five other sister chapters throughout the state of California, including in the Inland Empire, San Diego, and also three in, in Northern California, and we work closely with them as part of the NAOP California Council. Um, but, you know, we, you know, there, there's legislation, uh, for example, AB 1000, which, which you may be familiar with, which is the warehouse ban bill. Uh, this has been an ongoing bill uh, in various iterations that have, that's come up in the state legislature over the past uh, three years now, at least three years, and, and we're heading into the fourth year. It, that this That's was a, a warehouse ban, ban yeah. banning warehouses. So, so what it what it the language of the bill essentially prohibits the development, new development, and also the expansion of uh, existing warehouses and logistics facilities uh, that that uh, unless unless there's a thousand foot uh, uh, mitigation. All right, a thousand with from sensitive receptors. Uh, that that's really a, a huge mitigation. You know that what what the members offering that is, and it's and it's un, and it's unacceptable to our industry. Um, that would put a lot of existing businesses out of business. Essentially, if you it, to require a thousand foot uh, mitigation, um, whether it's from the the you know, and 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 what's not clearly defined is is it from the the uh, edge of the lot or is it from dock doors what is that's what, that's also very important what, where where the thousand foot starts but what's driving the ban so what's driving it are uh unscrupulous elected officials on the one hand um who are beholden to so-called environmental justice activists um who are not interested in comp any kind of compromise any kind of um you know uh meeting eye to eye with industry um uh, or, and meeting eye to eye also with the building trades, for example, because, uh, you know, uh, building trades unions like Layuna and the carpenters are not enthused about such, such you know, uh, mitigation uh, propositions. Um, and, and this would, this, you know, the original uh, language of, of the warehouse ban bill, AB 1000, uh, called, this was a statewide bill originally. Um, she, the author, uh, assembly member Reyes, from the Inland Empire, she has uh, amended the bill in this latest iteration of the bill, uh, which came out in January uh, of 2024. The latest iteration uh, tried to focus more on the Inland Empire. Uh, that was her. That was 
part of our amendments, but at the end of the day, we fought it. Mayav Sokel, we fought it through our, uh, by mobilizing a grassroots campaign. Uh, we got our members, um, Mayav Sokel members throughout Southern California, and you know, we're great, grateful to, for ex example, our, our members who are brokers, commercial real estate brokers, because they have offices throughout the state. And, and you know, they uh, were able to amplify this and get, get their colleagues in, in other offices, Northern California, San Diego, uh, you know, uh, Central Valley, to, to also use our action alert system, use our, our campaign, call and email the nine key state legislators who were going to take up this matter in early January of 2024. It was the State Assembly's Local Government Committee. And the Local Government Committee, of course, it, it deals with local government issues. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and some of those members are former local officials as well. They know how local government operates. They know that local government likes to control things that are you know, handled locally, right? So many, many state legislatures who have a local government background, you know, respect the fact that, you know, local government authority is important over certain issues, including land use issues, including zoning and zoning ordinance uh, amendments and potential changes. They know that that's more of a local government matter. State, the state should not interfere. Uh, and so when we, when we argued, you know, our point was this is, you know, this is uh, uh, overstepping the bounds of, uh, you know, the state, the state legislature, this local governments ought to decide, and local governments have. Uh, for, for example, in Fontana, in Fontana, a few years ago, there was a, a basically a, an agreement to have 300-foot setbacks from sensitive receptors, 300-foot mitigation. And that, that, the Fontana agreement is what we call good neighbor policies. It, it's what we call, you know, uh, good industrial guidelines and good neighbor policies that so you guys is a win-win okay for the nice for the city. Good compromise. It's a compromise. Yeah. It's a win-win for the city, for industry. It's something that, that industry can live with, that real estate, commercial real estate developers um, can live with, that 300-foot setback from sensitive receptors. And also, in the Fontana case, the attorney general also approved it. The state attorney general said, you know what, this is a good compromise. What do they and consider? Other, other cities have followed the yeah. Fontana model. But what, what do they consider a sensitive receptor? So we're talking about schools, we're talking about uh, uh, clinics, hospitals. Um, some, some state legislatures, uh, you, know, all, you know, they try to include like parks, for example. But, but oftentimes, <laughs> parks themselves are the buffer between an actual sensitive receptor, including homes, homes, schools, yeah. hospitals, and industry. The, the parks I serve see. as the buffer, right? Mm -hmm. Parks that have a lot of shade, for example, and, and rolling hills, um, that's a really good buffer to have. And, but sometimes they throw in the park as a sensitive receptor, and that's, that's really not, you know, that's, that's not right. And, and it's, and it's, it's just, it's, it's uh, taking advantage of, of what a, the cl a clear definition of a sensitive receptor ought to be. Yeah. And so that, we killed, we killed this it, bill temporarily, temporarily. Temporarily. Here's why it's temporary. It was a two year bill introduced in 20, in 2023, yeah. carried over into 2024. Um, it's temporarily uh, out of the, you know, uh, killed because she knew she didn't have the votes in the local government committee. Our, you know, getting our members mobilized and chiming in really, really was effective. And she pulled it. She pulled it from consideration before the hearing happened. I see. Now she's got till another month and a half, roughly, till the end of February to introduce a new bill, possibly with amended language, with language that she may she may think would would uh, pacify and satisfy uh, her base of in, of so-called environmental ju justice activists. Yeah. She and she, she may she may localize it, possibly to strictly the Inland Empire instead of a statewide mm -hmm. a statewide ban. Um, 
but this is this is deleterious. It's it's deleterious for our industry. We're going to keep fighting this because yeah. this. I mean, you've got a lot of jobs on the line. You've got building trades, union jobs on the line. Economy's impacted. Yeah. Economy's impacted. Supply. It, it would, yeah. Exactly, it would impact the supply chain in a negative way. Right. Um, and and the fact is that as a result of the COVID pandemic, as you know, Nadek, yeah. you know, you've you've had this this uh, expansion of industrial facilities, logistics centers, um, 3PL, right. warehouses, um, you know, you know, warehouses generally, cold storage warehouses. You've had this expansion happening right. because of demand, because of consumer demand. Right. And and you also have, you know, older warehouses that are being purchased, torn yeah. down and redeveloped into new class A structures. Right. And and you know that, not yeah. you know this better than I do. Yeah. When you redevelop and build a class A structure, you're talking about more environmentally friendly building materials right. that are being used, right? You're talking about like solar panels oftentimes right. on your roof. There's so yeah. much benefit uh, you know, uh, you know, in terms of uh you know, decarbonization, right. um, in terms of just, you know, trying to, trying to be more mindful of, yeah. I'll, I'll of the environment. I'll tell you from our, my experience with Maestro, in all the projects and developments we do, the, the, the main premise of all of them is that the supply can't keep up with the demand. Infrastructure, is, there's not enough of infrastructure, and the existing infrastructure is failing. So everything we work on, whether it's healthcare, uh, government projects, uh, you know, multifamily um, housing. The demand is so great, and the infrastructure is either really old, is failing, or there's just not enough, right? And this, I think, this warehouse ban would continue to elevate that even more. Um, you know, and, and you see Amazon; they're building these huge warehouses, right? I mean, we need we need to have local supply. Yeah. Um, and also, yeah. also in our infill uh, areas of, of, especially in Los Angeles County, uh, you know, the closer you are to the ports, uh, and certainly our ports um, have rebounded um, uh, in, in recent yeah. months uh, in terms of, you know, more shipping coming through the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Uh, part of that has to do with uh, the Panama Canal. Uh, relatively drying yeah. up, not allowing as much shipping uh, on a daily basis through the canal. Uh, and part of it is also due to the, the crisis in the Middle East and the Suez Canal and, yeah. and, uh, and shipping companies rerouting and going through the Pacific. So, so there's more shipping now happening right. uh, <coughs> over the Pacific Ocean, bypassing the Suez right. Canal, bypassing the Panama Canal, and going through West Coast ports, certainly the ports right. of Long Beach and Los Angeles. You have... You have, you know, the, in terms of intermodal rail um, and and uh, you know commercial fleet truck truck right. fleets, you know, you've got a lot of improvement there. Um, it's all tied together, and if you have a, a hiccup in anywhere along that supply chain, and you, you don't have local resources, it causes huge havoc. Right? But that, and that's exactly, yeah. and that's why infill locations, right? Um, so clo as as close as you can be yeah. to the ports is so beneficial to, to so many logistics companies, so many companies that need, need warehouses yeah. uh, and need to, need to turn it around quickly, uh, need to move the goods quickly. Um, and, and, and so you, you, but at the same time, you see pushback from, from local and county governments as well. Uh, and you see it in the city of LA, you see it in the county of Los Angeles, you see it in certain cities like Pomona, where Nayab Sokal, we're at the forefront of of trying to defeat a draconian, uh, uh, a draconian draft zoning ordinance that that effectively would would uh, would ban um, any kind of fulfillment oriented or distribution oriented facility that's that's greater than twenty two thousand five hundred square feet. Uh, it would put limitations uh, on distribution oriented facilities, um, uh, especially those that don't have a manufacturing component to them. This so, is really draconian, and this yeah. this is this is uh, you know we're leading the fight in Pomona. We have over the past uh, roughly six months since this draft, happening in Pomona? draft zoning ordinance came out that they they basically want to 
want to restrict fulfillment oriented and distribution oriented um, uses that have existed there right. for decades, for decades. Pomona being a manufacturing base, uh, the aerospace industry being, being uh, robust through 1980s, but it, a change happened in the 80s. A lot of you know, abandoned facilities were purchased by commercial real estate developers and redeveloped. Uh, and you have a very you know, a robust distribution base there uh, and a manufacturing base. Uh, while the city is very, um, you know, amenable to manufacturers and manufacturing, yeah. they're not they're not amenable to fulfillment oriented. So we're talking about right. trucks and, and trucking and right. and 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 also. Um, I mean, that whole region is all it, industrial manufacturing, it, right? Exactly, yeah. and it's and 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 it's at the crossroads of so many corridors, both rail and highway. You've got multiple yeah. highways crisscrossing. From the fifty-seven to the sixty, the seventy-one, right. and 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 a lot of and a lot of those arteries certainly connect to our our ports. So and, and it's, yeah. as, as does the railway that 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 goes through Pomona as well. So you know, it's very important for for the city in terms of uh, tax revenue coming from the commercial real estate industry to the city. Commercial real estate industry makes up about and industrial real, real estate in particular eight percent of uh, of of properties in the city of Pomona. It's not really a huge percentage of properties. 8% is really not a lot. Do you think that this is a hyper-focus specific to California and Los Angeles, Orange County areas? Or do you think this is gonna, this is growing out like federally across the nation or? This what, is, you know yeah, I mean? this, this is more, this is happening in LA County especially. Uh, we, we don't see so much of this in Orange County. There have been a few efforts which again, they have SoCal. We stepped up in terms in Lake Forest. They had some issues with with uh, potential limitations to warehousing in, in the city of Lake Forest. Uh, also in the city of Irvine, we stepped up. We uh, we got our members to advocate. We spoke at city council meetings, and we we prevented any kind of uh, of negative uh, zoning ordinance um, that that would have impacted existing uh, industrial. Uh, uses in those in those two cities warehouse uses, but we don't see it happening too much in OC. We see it happening more in LA County and with juris and municipal jurisdictions in LA County. We see it happening in some Inland Empire jurisdictions as well. So, and and the thing is, like in LA County, for example, last year in in seven unincorporated unincorporated areas of LA County, including places like East Los Angeles and yeah. and the Dominguez. Hills uh, section and Willowbrook, they they tried to essentially downzone and rezone existing industrial. They tried to instead get new new zones. One of them uh, was called an artisan manufacturing zone, yeah. which is which is essentially um, you know rezoning to create these these sort of live workspaces, mixed use spaces, where you have an artisan living and working in a building, essentially, creating more of that in those seven unincorporated areas. They also wanted like more life science parks mm. in those seven unincorporated areas. But our argument was, you've got a, an existing base of industrial, and a lot of the people who work in, in those seven unincorporated areas live, live near their work as well. So it's beneficial to them and their families. If you're trying to bring life science parks into those, those areas, where is your workforce? Where's your workforce coming? Is the workforce in those areas, immediate areas, are they, have they been developed or not? Uh, and we believe they're not. We believe the workforce would have to come from, you know, several miles out. Uh, and we, so we fought that. Like, we talked to, you know, city, uh, the county planning. This is a county matter. We talked to county planning. We said this, this really doesn't make sense uh, to, to, to down zone to, and, and drive out existing industrial <laughs> uses and businesses it would hurt the owners it would also hurt tenants uh whose uses would no longer be be valid so they've temporarily tabled this in la county um they're now studying it they have this so-called five-year plan where they're they're engaging with stakeholders including with 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 us and with our our members they're they're trying to do some economic impact analyses within the next five years we're really concerned about it though because we think that this will come back in five years yeah. uh, with, with, uh, with no 
uh, you know, new findings that would justify having artists in manufacturing or life science parks in those seven unincorporated areas. We, we feel yeah. that, that they're, they're, they're going to come out with studies to try to justify, but it remains to be seen. We are vigilant about this. Our membership's vigilant. Uh, we are not letting up this fight. Um, Where do you see it going down the road? Because obviously in L.A. County, you know, it's very built out. There's, there's not a lot of open land, right? The manufacturing industrial uh, facilities out there now, they've been there for decades, right? If they get zoned out, if that gets limited, they're going to have to shut down. And I feel like it's going to go out further out in the outskirts, right? Absolutely. Um, but and that's not good. It's not good, right? When it, uh, I mean, it's not good in the sense that it really counters the argument that the so-called environmental justice activists are making you know, that this, you know, uh, truck traffic, right, having diesel trucks yeah. uh, on freeways driving, you know, dozens, if not hundreds, hundreds of miles back and forth between logistics centers uh, and and communities, uh, you know, logistics yeah. centers out, out in the Inland Empire, out um, north in Lancaster, Palmdale, Hesperia area, yeah. uh, you know, having, having, having them do, you know, pick up those extra miles in order to fulfill in, for example, yeah. LA County, the, their, arg their argument falls flat because, because if, we, if we don't take advantage of last mile, last mile facilities in infill in Los Angeles, okay, and we're talking about facilities that oftentimes are, are redeveloped uh, by developers um, and, you know, class A structures, <laughs> Um, you know, with solid building materials used, yeah. you know that you know that better than I do. If those last mile facilities don't exist, then we are you know we aren't doing justice to the environment. I wonder if they're, they're, yeah. so. So you need these last mile facilities. You need them close to where the consumer, you know, a bulk of the consumer yeah. base is, and certainly in LA County, you know, with with twenty mil, roughly twenty million citizens. You know, you've got a huge consumer base there who, who you know, who want their orders fulfilled right. and delivered, you know, in a fairly efficient and quick manner. That's interesting. So, I, I think as you as you mentioned and talk about this, I wonder if there's an opportunity to kind of have a win win and merge both worlds where you could potentially have industrial and other types of development in the same area, you know, um, and that happens yeah. often with overlays, yeah. right? So, so, so you have some cities uh, that that do it the right way, like Torrance, for example, where oftentimes you have a you have your commercial and industrial base, and and then they add an, an add yeah. an overlay on that base, and uh, for multifamily, for example. Right. And 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 I must reiterate, Neab SoCal, we are we are blessed to have a wide array of members, including from not just from the industrial sector, but also from the office, retail, and mixed-use multifamily sectors as well. We're, what, do, what do you guys we're do? We're blessed to have yeah. you know, uh, membership and member companies straddling all of these. <laughs> what kind sectors. of ad advocation do you guys do for those types of uh, markets? So, so, I mean, it, look, it's, it's pretty much the same. Where we, we, we're tech, you know, we, we often uh, argue that uh, making it easier to at which the state and local governments and certainly some citizens initiative you know they love to to add new taxes special taxes yeah uh uh you know that's bad for all of our members that's we, bad for we were talking office, about tpa or, right yeah, yeah yeah so so the taxpayer protection act that's that is a ballot measure that may have socal and and partner organizations with whom we work we we help collect signatures to get on the November, to get TPA the Taxpayer Protection Act on the November 2024 ballot as a ballot measure, and we got the requisite signatures. What exactly that were is that? Basically, no. the TPA would essentially make it make it harder to increase uh, special taxes by way of citizen citizens initiatives uh, and and also local government. Um, initiatives. So it, you would need basically what we're saying is 
we're trying to, stre to, to protect and strengthen Prop 13, Proposition 13, taxpayer protections. This Prop Proposition 13 goes back to 1978, um, and these are taxpayer protections that, that make it harder it, uh, to, to raise special taxes. You need two a two-thirds vote, basically, uh, uh, to raise special tax. That's what the TPA essentially advocates, that, that two-thirds two -thirds of the electorate, as opposed to a simple majority of 50% plus one, mm -hmm. is needed in order for a special tax to pass. We're, we're not talking about general taxes, right, which could be used for, for any type of general use. We're talking about special taxes that... Uh, like, for example, the documentary transfer tax that the city of L.A. Uh, passed. It's also, it was known as Measure ULA. Some folks called it the, the mansion tax. In November 2022, that ballot measure passed in the city of L.A. It also passed, similar ballot measure passed in Culver City and in Santa Monica as well, which basically added another round of taxes, this time on document, documentary transfers on the sale uh, and the, the and the entirety of the sale of any property between five and ten million dollars in the city of Los Angeles. So you that was a four percent added tax, a four percent special tax for the sale of any property valued between five and ten million dollars, and a five and a half percent tax added tax on any value on any property valued at yeah. ten million or more. And what happened, as you may remember, Nadig, there was a a, a selling frenzy before the April 1st, 2023 uh, implementation right. of Measure ULA. That last last couple months, last year, March and uh, March and February of last year, it was just a frenzy. Yeah. Everyone tried to whatever they wanted. I mean, it doesn't to sell, make sold. sense. I mean, the way the market's going now, five million dollars sounds like a lot, but with real estate going up so exponentially. In a, in a few years, like you're gonna, you're not gonna be able to buy a house for five million dollars. Obviously, I'm being sarcastic, but um, yeah. yeah, whether it's yeah. House, houses, houses, yeah. uh, commercial properties, right. everyone's impacted. And sure, and the yeah. purpose of of that measure was to, you know, to set a, to basically to set aside funding coming from the documentary transfer tax uh, to to uh, address homelessness issues, and. The goal of the city was to to reap in, uh, you know, north of nine hundred million dollars. As far as, uh, you know, the first year of implementation, twenty twenty three, and how much they've they've actually uh, benefited from this, it's uh, roughly two hundred two hundred million. So they're nowhere near where the goal is. But is um, there any accountability? I mean, have you seen any accountability? We're, we're fighting, by the way, our, our industry and, yeah. and and certain uh, some of our partner organizations like the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association. They're they're fighting this. It's in the appeals process right now. There's there's two cases right now, uh, in 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 the appellate uh, courts. Um, uh, but so there might be a chance it could be repealed. There might be a chance. There was there. So there there were two cases in late 2023, and the judge ruled in favor of the city of Los Angeles, basically, uh, saying that that you know uh, you know there should be no changes. Uh, to this to this ballot measure, so yeah. that's being appealed right now. The county last year they they were toying with the idea of introducing something similar. L.A. County happened in city of L.A. happened in Culver City in Santa Monica. Let's give you know let's see if this could work in L.A. County as well. And what they ended up doing is they created a um, a task force to look into it. And, and the task force included uh, you know local government representatives, L.A. County. Um, it included representatives from nonprofit sectors and non and and, and uh, like United Way. It included uh, business associations, including the LA Chamber of Commerce and others. And uh, my co my colleague at NAMP SoCal, um, uh, you know, who's a government affairs prof professional, was you know at the forefront of of trying to prevent this from right. happening. Uh, and and ultimately they prevailed. They succeeded. Uh, documentary transfer tax. Uh, was scuttled. The idea of that was scuttled within the task force. They also looked into a, a potential parcel tax instead. Yeah. The parcel tax idea was also scuttled. Uh, so, and and a lot of the you know the credit goes to to my colleague. I won't name him, uh, but you know he he was uh, he was at the forefront of of educating 
members of the task force that this would, at the end of the day, this would, would uh, hurt business. It would, and it would, it would have a trickle down effect. It would hurt business, it would hurt jobs, uh, certainly uh, in the commercial sector, commercial real estate sector, industrial sector. So, you know, but this kind of thing, we, we could see it again. We, you know, this could come back again. So uh, we're very, very much concerned about uh, whether it's county or other cities modeling the mansion tax measure ULA and introducing it in their own, in their own cities. So that's something we're, we're keeping very, uh, a very close eye on. Um, but so, so the Ta Taxpayer Protection Act, it is now in jeopardy, you know, so this was, this was done, you know, with, with uh, requisite number of signatures collected to get it on the ballot measure. Mm -hmm. And the state legislature in California, Governor Newsom, and the head of the state Democratic Party. And I must say, NAOP SoCal, we are nonpartisan. We work with both sides of the aisle equally, yeah. Democrats and Republicans in the state legislature. But in this case, the state legislature and the head of the Democratic Party of the state, they have filed a lawsuit against the Taxpayer Protection Act. They don't want TPA to be a ballot measure in the November 2024 ballot. They do not want the electorate to ultimately decide the fate of this ballot measure. That's nuts. Yeah. They want the California Supreme Court, essentially, which is, which is the jurisdiction in which this case is in right now, is currently in, they want the court to decide whether or not this ballot measure ought to, ought to remain, ought to be valid. And that's wrong. You know, this, this, this is, you know, the electorate should decide whether it should be easy or difficult to increase any special taxes moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. At the end of the day, we're so overtaxed throughout the state of California, certainly here in Southern California, um, that, you know, we, we need to be mindful of what the citizenry, what the electorate wants and give the electorate a chance to voice out, do they want more special taxes or not? How often are you spending time in Sacramento speaking to, you know, your constituents up there? Speaking to representatives up there, are you up there a lot? What what is your like? Nayap SoCal is heavily involved in Sacramento. Not not so much me personally, but my my colleague. I have a, our senior director of government affairs uh, is, is uh, very much involved in Sacramento. His name is Jose Cornejo. He's a he's a political and, and policy making community. Um, he is he has served. Uh, as a senior staff member uh, so he's on the congressional there, level and on, okay. on the state level. He is, he is often up there. We also have lobbyists up in Sacramento as well who are, who are uh, consultants uh, that NAOP SoCal and NAOP California that we retain, NAOP, uh, all, all of the uh, NAOP uh, branches, the chapters throughout California, we retain uh, a, uh, another association and their lobbyists that lobby for the interest of the commercial real estate industry so, up there as well. So it's a combination of my colleague, okay. Mr. Cornejo, and also uh, additional lobbyists in Sacramento. And, and so when TPA comes up and the threat to TPA, uh, and, and another threat to TPA is also a piece of legislation that was introduced late last year, uh, right before the end of the session, called ACA 13. It's a constitutional amendment uh, uh, an ACA, ACA 13. 13, it was an, uh, a state assembly constitutional amendment, and basically its mission was to make it easier to, uh, in, uh, uh, to pass new special taxes. That could go on the ballot. I mean, the idea of introducing it was to ultimately not just get it passed right. and approved in the state legislature, which happened. It, we fought it. We fought it hard. We uh, we uh, we lost by two <laughs> votes uh, in the uh, in the state senate, um, but that is that there's a likelihood that that could be ACA 13 could be a ballot measure in the November 2024 ballot. Um, so you could have if if the California Supreme Court does not intervene uh, and make a decision on the lawsuit against TPA, you could have both ballot measures appear in the November ballot, both Taxpayer Protection Act and also ACA 13, two competing right. ballot measures. If viewers are watching right now and they want to get involved, they, they agree with 
what you're saying, right? Um, especially on the commercial real estate side, how, how do they get involved? How do they Naop, connect? Naopsocal.org, N-A-I-O-P, S-O-C-A-L.org. Uh, we, you know, my colleagues and I, we have a great, great team at Naop Socal, led by our CEO, Timothy Jamal. Uh, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, you know, Becky and Shelby and Diana, my se our senior legislative colleague, Jose Corneo, and our board. We have a very strong board of directors, uh, roughly 50, 50 professionals who serve on our board, um, led by this year, in 2024, led by Mr. Eric Paulson, who is the president of brokerage for Kidder Matthews uh, in California and in Arizona. Um, you know, under, under our board's direction and leadership, um, you know, we strive to maintain uh, quality programming uh, on the education front. So we have a lot of educational programming for uh, professionals in the commercial real estate industry, including for young professionals, uh, 35 and under. We have a, a, what we call a YPG program, a young professionals group. Uh, it's a very competitive program to get into. Often over 100 applicants apply for uh, roughly 30 positions um, uh, in that for, the, for each year's YPG cohort. Uh, and it's, a, it's competitive and, it's, and um, it's sought after because we have you know, a, a few professors uh, who, yeah. who specialize in commercial real estate teaching courses to our YPG cohort. So we have that group, we have NAOP University, which has, you know, uh, which, which has additional uh, programming uh, for all of our members, those who are interested, all kinds of- And you guys all, have all upcoming and we have, events, and we have social, events, yeah. social so, events. So our, our three pillars are legislative, educational, and social network slash networking. And so we have throughout the year, we have several networking events. Our, uh, one of our more, more coveted events is Night at the Fights. It centers around... Uh, 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 Where is that? That's, you that's always... That? That, we've, been, that? we've been having that at the Orange County Fairgrounds. Okay. And so that draws in over a thousand people, over a thousand. So our members, our non-members, uh, they come in, they watch some boxing. Uh, we, uh, let, this past year, we threw in a little Lucha Libre as well. Uh, for, for some giggles, but at the end of the day, it's a great opportunity to get together, to network. It's, it's, it's really, it's a great night. It usually centers around a theme. Uh, in 2023, it was Havana Nights. That was our theme, a Cuban theme. So uh, that's, our, that's one of our, you know, our, our prized uh, and sought after events, but we also have our awards gala in May, uh, where, where we honor industry professionals. Um, you know, with, with various uh, 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 prizes that are given uh, for different categories, you know, you know uh, whether it's architecturally related or engineering. And this is amazing because we, yeah. we've covered on our podcast design, construction, capital funding, you know, all the kind of like the, yep. the nuts and bolts of development. Yeah. But this is such a critical uh, topic as well, government relations and how that controls business and growth, and especially here in California. It, what, it impacts. Yeah, it impacts has a huge impact. So right? many companies, whether it's on the taxation side, whether it's on the zoning side with with dezoning, right. uh, downzoning, and rezoning, uh, whether it's you know whether it's uh, you know attempts to to limit or restrict certain uses, uh, including you know specifically industrial. Uh, oriented uses yeah. comes to fulfillment and distribution. You know, we want to prevent any, and by the, the, it's not just preventing, we want to educate, you know, whether they're city managers or city planners and, and, you know, some cities get it, they get it pretty quick. They, they understand, you know, the, the value of, of having a, a strong commercial real estate base in their yeah. cities, straddling, you know, uh, I mean, you said, industrial retail office, right. That's um, right there, yeah. Multifamily, you know, straddling, you know, a little bit of, of, of everything. And certainly there are some sectors that are that have, as you know, Nadek, they've taken huge hits, including especially office. Yeah. Uh, with, with, you know, the return to work really not happening um, uh, for, for a, lot of, a, a lot of companies, especially in downtown areas. 
uh, where we see uh, you know tremendous vacancy rates uh, to this day, and you know, right. and 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 certainly you know some companies are are are, are looking into adaptive reuse to ad to adapt right. these office spaces into residential or you know even potentially into data centers. Right. Um, <clears throat> so that but there's there's a lot of regulations there that need to be met environmental and, and also certainly engineering quagmires as well structural right. engineering quagmires right. when you're trying to adapt yeah you, you we're know, looking you know that well stuff yeah so what, what's next for you miran what's coming up this so, year and next year yeah we're excited we're excited about you know 2024 we hit the ground running with ab 1000 in the early days of january and and trying to stop it and we were successful in doing it we anticipate there's going to be another where you know iteration of a warehouse ban bill uh, before the end of February, and that's the deadline basically for new bills to be introduced this year for this legislative cycle in, in Sacramento. Um, you know, we'll be continuing our, our engagement with municipalities uh, throughout LA and Orange counties uh, on, on potential zoning code changes, um, on, on uh, you know, potential uh, uh, comprehensive uh, zoning you know, ordinance updates, uh, general plan updates, right. cities. Cities are mandated by the state to uh, update their general plans on a, usually on a, a 10 to 20 year basis. Uh, so some, some cities, you know, are, uh, are updating their general plans. We want to make sure yeah. that there's nothing that's uh, deleterious to the interests of the commercial real estate industry in, in these updated plans. <laughs> We also go on the offense, uh, as we did, you know, with the Taxpayer Protection Act, and uh, we have uh, uh, some legislation in mind where we're we're on the offense. I w won't talk about it now. Perhaps on a, on Next a future podcast. visit. Yeah. On a future visit. I'd love yeah. to talk about it once once uh, once it's introduced. Yeah. Uh, but we're doing more of that, um, and 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 uh, we're, you know, we our industry is often. Playing defense, but but it's important that we we also introduce our own initiatives yeah. that that would uh, amplify uh, the concerns of the industry and try to try to come up with some solutions by way of legislation. And that's that's when you know playing more offense right. is usually beneficial. Right. It, it incur you know it, it involves a lot of uh, relationship building with with uh, key legislators out there who are who are mindful of our industry, who are appreciative of our industry and, and, and want the business community generally to succeed in their, in their jurisdictions. Um, so it involves a lot of handholding, relation building, education, educating elected officials and staff on the merits of legislation right. that, w that we are proposing and that they would, that they would be essentially yeah. authoring, um, we would we would be sponsoring, but they would be authoring. Yeah. That's a little sneak peek yeah. of what we've okay. got in store for this well, year, uh, and we're looking forward to uh, our fly-ins, as I mentioned, uh, in mid February, 2024. The fly-in to Washington D.C. We're planning uh, our first fly-in to Sacramento uh, to meet with state legislators uh, in the end of February, 2024. We usually do a, cu a couple uh, advocacy trips to Sacramento each year. Got it. Well, this has been amazing. I mean, I think you gave a lot of great information. Um, thank you for coming on and sharing everything you guys do for it's the market. Honor. Yeah. It's an honor. I'm, I'm really pleased to have this conversation with you, Nadeg, because you're, you're in the industry. Right. You know it well. Um, you've done some fascinating, uh, built some fascinating structures. You know what it means to, to, to build Class A structures and using, using environmentally friendly materials. That's why you I, was, get it. I was excited when you were agreed to come on the podcast and talk a little bit about what's going on. I think it's a lot of valuable information that a lot of people aren't aware of. Hopefully, uh, watching this podcast, everyone's got more information. Um, we'll put some links to to you so people can get a hold of you. Um, yeah, links to yeah. Nap SoCal. Nap absolutely. SoCal, absolutely. Be grateful. And uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Nadek. How, how is the cigar? Is it good? Avo Intermezzo. Talking, so. Avo Intermezzo. It's great. It's, 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 it's nice and light. I like it. Nice, nice. Well, thanks everybody for watching. If you made it this far, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next podcast. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to the Maestro Minute Podcast. 
Make sure to rate this podcast if you found it helpful, share it with a friend that could use it, and follow us on all major podcast platforms. The Maestro Minute, powered by Maestro Development.